Thank you. Appreciate the opportunity today to uh, be able to speak to everybody. Would like to share some of my experiences in successfully commercializing alternate proteins, basically from the early bench top all the way to um, customers' plates. Uh, presentation will be about 20 minutes. We got started a little late, so I'll, I'll try and pull it up a little. My main goal is to give you insight both on the commercialization path of the products and also the contract manufacturing landscape. Uh, capacity to get fermentation to commercialize these products is a, a hot topic these days, and I want to touch on that at the end. So very brief perspective. I've been uh, focused on uh, industrial biotech for 15 years now, first of a kind biotech. Um, most of that time I was in house with um, Impossible Foods as their chief engineering officer in the early days. I was with the company Solazyme and built a very large fermentation facility in Brazil. I've done a fair amount of work with Good Food Institute on, on some of their publications. And I've also become fairly outspoken in recent years about what I see as a real shortfall in fermentation capacity, along with some other consultants I work with that I'm concerned is gonna limit some of the ability of the products everyone is trying to develop to get to commercial scale. So high level, you'll hear a lot of people talk about novel proteins. You know, obviously we're talking things made from fermentation. We're talking about agricultural products, other things. I think you saw that, that diagram a minute ago of Good Food Institutes and how um, fermentation is kind of at the epicenter of that. While all of those products are obviously great, I'm only gonna focus on the, the center, the fermentation today, but obviously we need all of that to succeed. And frankly, our fermentation feeds a lot of those areas, but my, my area is gonna dive into specifically the fermentation side. So since I know many on this call are early stage companies, I'm gonna talk about first kind of the commercial pathway. Um, most people start at, at pilot, and I like to talk about both the size of what that is and what you're intending to do at that scale. Um, pilot, I usually consider under a thousand liters. You're making, you know, maybe a kilogram per batch, depending upon your product. This is really just to show proof of concept. And the terminology here is U.S. terminology, but I assume in Israel it's similar, and I know it is in Europe, there's some regulatory approvals you're going to need to show that your novel food is safe to eat. Generally, this is the stage you're trying to generate a lot of that data and enough samples to do things like toxicology to start that initial regulatory process. One thing I like to point out here is this is generally all an R&D cost. I, I work with companies that aspire to make revenue and offset some of their costs at this stage. I'll tell you from my own experience, I consider that aspirational. I generally see that happen. Um, once they get past the filet phase, they move to the demonstration phase. Um, for things like precision fermentation, I consider this maybe the 5,000 to 100,000 liter scale. This is a stage where you're making metric tons per batch. This is enough material, not just to do research, but to seed the market, um, work with CPGs to really confirm whether there's a market for your product if you build a larger scale facility, and also to generate, frankly, the engineering data you need to build that larger scale facility. Um, the, the issue here is, and I should have pointed out in the pilot, average pilot a benchmark number, maybe one to five million dollars US to build a, a pilot to do novel proteins through fermentation. When we move to demonstration scale, you'll see the numbers go up a lot more. Typical number, maybe 25 to 50 million US to build that kind of facility. This is often the scale that, that most struggle with in scaling up. Um, in industrial biotech, because the numbers start getting bigger. If you're going to spend 25 to 50 million on a demonstration facility, you're probably going to have to raise 75 or 100 million dollars. And you're still, unfortunately, usually not profitable at this stage. You might be selling some level of product, but not generally enough to be profitable. The first commercial is the first point where you're really 
um, at a scale that you hope to make money. Um, these facilities are pretty large. They're fairly expensive. Again, for food proteins, I'm thinking a, you know, Clara Foods egg protein and impossible heme, a, um, you know, uh, remilk dairy type protein. Those are the things that generally have to be done at very large scale. Those facilities typically ballpark, maybe 150 to $400 million US. And they can take in the range of three years to construct. So let me, you know, the whole idea of this is to de-risk as you go forward to basically bring the technology risk at each stage lower and lower. So let's jump into typical fermentation processes. You know, most of them are an aseptic aerobic fermentation. And this is focused more on, again, the precision proteins for things like the mycoproteins. Um, they don't always need all this equipment for, for a lot of the secreted higher value proteins that many are targeting. This is a common configuration you'll see. Fermentation followed by a distax centrifuge to remove the cell biomass. Um, usually then there'll be a cleanup step, even though you've removed the cells, to get other cell pieces and larger um, materials out of the broth. And then to basically hold your target protein while getting rid of media and things through ultrafiltration. And then on to spray drying if it's a dried product. This process here probably represents 20 companies at least I have worked for in the last seven years. It's, it's basically a size separated downstream of a novel protein. Now, this is what you hope to get to at large scale. What I like to do is then work backwards and you're gonna see equipment drop in that's typical lab scale equipment that my guess is represents a, a lot of the type or actual model of equipment many doing early stage scale up work are using. What's important here is in some cases, and I'll use fermentation as an example, the bench top moderately to fairly well represents large scale. I'm not saying you should jump from two or five liters all the way up to 100,000 liters, but I can tell you for many proven processes, the performance you'll get at a two or five liter scale fairly well represents what will happen at larger scale. Um, in other areas, in the second unit operation here, the the centrifuge is often very different. This is a batch centrifuge that's used a lot in very early scale proof of concept work. The problem is, well, while it will show you a proof of concept, what it takes to remove the cells and what your broth might look like, this type of benchtop centrifuge usually has like a 99.5% removal efficiency, which is much higher than the continuous centrifuges you'll use at large scale. I like to point this out because it's important in each of these unit operations to understand how well they represent the large scale fermentation and or the overall process so that you understand the obstacles you might run into as you get to larger scale. So let me kind of dig into this a little deeper. You know, scaling up a unit operation, an individual unit operation is much different than the overall process. When you when your goal is commercial viability, your concern is basically the economics of the overall process. And I see frankly in the industry a lot more focus on fermentation because that's where the expertise of many of the founders comes from. I can tell you from personal experience, the downstream recovery generally costs as much or more in a large facility than fermentation. And it's really where I think a lot of the, uh, the economics still need to be proven out in that downstream recovery. So let's kind of jump in and I'm gonna move a little along just because of time. You'll see, see these different scale up stages. When I look at risk of scale up and I do a lot of due diligence work for investors looking at early stage technologies, there's a couple things I look at. I look at the individual unit operations, where you're at at pilot, your demonstration and commercial, 
how big of a scale up jump you're talking about, meaning just the raw size difference between your pilot, your demonstration scale and commercial. You often um, read in a lot of literature, even some of my publications, you know, a target in the industry is 10 to one scale up. I'll tell you, that's a few more steps than many can do. Um, very often I see 50, 75 to one scale up on an overall process utilized. It is, you know, it has a little bit of risk to it, but it's also the hours of representative operation. It's not just the size of the scale jump you do, but how much, um, how many hours of operation, thousand hours, is a standard that's out there. That's about five, six weeks of operation. But as important as what you're gonna see drop in here is how representative are your unit operations at each scale? And I use the example here of fermentation, as I said earlier, those benchtop fermenters can be fairly representative all the way to commercial scale if done correctly. The example I used earlier of that benchtop fermenter, when I go to a demonstration facility and I um, start using a continuous distack centrifuge, that's only going to have about, say, 97, 98% um, recovery of the organism, where the benchtop, say, had 99.5. So what does that mean? All of a sudden, my downstream, my microfiltration, ultrafiltration, all of that is seeing much more in the way of cell mass coming to it than it did at benchtop. This is why I like to point out that I would expect if you're using a um, batch centrifuge pilot, when you hit demonstration scale, you may see somewhat of a difference in how your, your microfiltration and other downstream operates. I like to point this out because it's important to understand and kind of have highlighted what you expect to be your areas you're going to need to work through. Um, practical insights um, as we scale up. Unfortunately, my guess is most of you that have started some kind of venture understand the financing to some degree is what I like to call the tail wagging the dog. You want to make sure you lead with your, your core underlying science and things, but how you finance it is certainly a, uh, an overlay that comes on. Everyone wants to be able to get debt financing to build a large facility. Very often the problem is that takes a lot of development work, especially at that demonstration scale, which can be quite expensive. So it becomes somewhat of a trade-off. As I like to say, there is no right or wrong. I've seen people do 10 to one scale up and fail. I've personally done 75 to one scale up and succeeded. It's more about aligning your funding sources with your risk profile. A, a, a more significant risk profile taking bigger jumps is okay if you're venture funded and your sources support that. If you're really expecting debt financing, you're going to be pretty disappointed if you're trying to do a 75 to 1 scale up and find out that's not something that banks typically are going to be willing to fund. The other thing I like to point out, and these are, these are based on real numbers of a, of a range of clients. This is a unit cost to make a food protein at pilot demonstration scale at commercial. And you're also gonna see some of the key components, raw materials, utilities, overhead and labor. And there's two things I like to point out with this. The first is economies of scale are real. As you get to very large facilities, the unit economics are much better. And I can tell you, this is from someone who scaled facilities from bench top up to the facility I built in Brazil was about 3.3 million liters. And the example I like to give, you'll notice especially the labor component, the light green drops dramatically at commercial scale. I can tell you I, the facility when I was with Solazyme, the demonstration facility and the commercial facility, the commercial facility had a capacity almost 50 times the demonstration facility, but it only had about six or seven times the number of uh, staff for the facility. So this is where that, that push to get to very large scale does bring your economics down. The, the problem is the more time you spend at pilot and demo, and I talked about this, it's a balance. It's those, those numbers of unit costs just favor, just are not always that favorable. What I like to say the ventures I've been in house at, 
the thing I like to do is to get to cash flow break even as, as soon as I can. Maybe I'm not um, making bottom line profit, but I'm at least not burning equity for my scale up operations. So with that, there's kind of a breaking point here, and I apologize to, to put two component presentations together, but as many questions as I get beyond scale up these days is it's great, we need to know how to scale up our technology, but do I need to build a facility or can I go out to contract manufacturing? So I want to hit just some brief um, subject areas on contract manufacturing. A lot of the industry has scaled through contract manufacturing sites historically. It's still a very good way to do it in lieu of building your own facility if you can. There are still options out there, but they're getting tougher to find. I track um, CMO facilities worldwide. I even have to define what a CMO is. To me, a contract manufacturer, and I'll use Fermic in Mexico City as an example, their predominant um, manufacturing is for others. While they do some of their own products, they predominantly manufacture for others. I would um, contrast that with the group I consider internal, the 23 internal facilities, where I would lump in companies like ADM and Cargill. They predominantly manufacture for themselves. They certainly, under certain circumstances, do manufacture for others. I look at that entire landscape out there. What I can tell you is, you know, you compare that. Now let's look at a greenfield opportunity or a brownfield. You know, if you're going to build your own facility, commercial scale for a food protein, it's going to take you three to four years to build for a full scale facility. Um, it's great that it's built specifically for your process, but you know the capital numbers are in the range of 150 to 400 million dollars. There are some companies that have utilized brownfields. That's usually an existing fermentation facility where you put in your own downstream. Um, I've certainly done this multiple times. I'll tell you the opportunities are getting tougher. There's just not a lot of um, idled facilities out there. Um, you certainly can save some time. What's in, you know, 30 to 48 months might come down to 16 to 24. Um, a lot of how good a fit it is depends on your process. You're going to end up generally having a downstream that's very specific to your process, but you're going to be utilizing a, a much older downstream, which brings you time, but it may or not may not bring you all the uh, um, functionality you hope for. So let's talk about, as you look at those two options, the contract fermentation market, and then building your own. This is a benchmark I did about a year ago with Good Food Institute, and I did a webinar with them and published this. I get about 61 million liters of total capacity out there today, both in the CMOs and the captive facilities. Um, the in, what I call the internal. What I think is important here to understand is almost all of these were built for another purpose other than food, mainly pharma, some for amino acids, some for chemicals. The other thing is of that 61 million liters, and again, these numbers are about a year old, um, I get that about 10 million liters comes in and out of contract in any given year. Only about 2 million liters of that is uh, appropriate for food production. And about a year ago, during my presentation with Good Food Institute, I predicted that most food fermentation CMO capacity would be consumed within 12 to 24 months. And you'll see this update dropping in here. I would tell you, based on my recent experience, I think we're close to there today. Um, you can find fermentation at facilities, but if you're looking to find a downstream appropriate to make food products, you're generally going to find that doesn't exist, that you can build it. You can spend, you know, 18, 24 months building it at a CMO site that has fermentation, but they generally do not have that, that capacity today. So unfortunately, this brings in kind of what I call kind of the stark reality out there that, 
Most of the CMO market is pretty old. I say 20 to 50 years, this is being polite. The average fermenter that most CMOs you're using today is 50 to 60 years old. It was built predominantly in Europe to make pharmaceuticals in the 1960s and 1970s. Um, there's been, and I think a lot of these facilities, they're doing amazing work to retrofit, to be able to host some of these processes. But the fact is they're somewhat limited in um, what you're gonna find in the way, especially their cost structure. And I'm, I'm moving through because I know we're near time. This is one slide I like to point out because this is kind of the gist of what I would encourage those trying to scale up through CMOs to understand. The cost of your manufacturing depends on scale. What it costs you to manufacture in a 50,000 liter fermenter is a much higher unit cost than a 500,000 liter fermenter. But you have to have a very high demand to get to the 500,000 liters. So this curve here is an example for an actual protein I've scaled up before. And you'll see just economies of scale, the unit cost manufacturing numbers drop up from the 70 range down to the 20 to 30s just by scale of facility. You know, if you get to a facility that's using 500,000 liter fermenters and is operating at, at millions of liters, and I'll tell you, there's a pretty short list of those facilities in the world. Um, there's a lot more capability at smaller scale. So to kind of wrap up, if you're a company out there looking to use CMOs, what I will tell you is, if you're under 100,000 liters and your target products, say in the 100, $150 per kilogram range, you're probably okay near term. If you're trying to get down, say, to the 75,000 liter and you're, um, you're looking at 100,000 liter scale or above, I would tell you, you, you have some moderate concern. I'm not telling you you have a problem, but you need a plan either to build your own facility or have firm con um, conversations with contract manufacturing sites to be able to do that. I will tell you, if you're looking to manufacture food protein under $75 a kilogram, you're very likely to need above 500,000 liters of capacity both an individual fermenter or at very large scale. And I would tell you, you need a concrete plan. You either need to be under contract with a large scale manufacturing organization or have a firm plan to build your own facility. So given time, I'm gonna skip the specific lessons other than to talk about Never forget in this, your food first and foremost, a lot of people come out of pharma and you want to keep everything you've learned in pharma, but understand you're in a very different cost structure. And if you're going to make food um, competitively, you may want to use some of those core underlying technologies, but it's going to have to be at a much more streamlined manufacturing operation and on a much larger scale. So with that, uh, I appreciate the time and would open up to questions if there is any time left. Thank you very much, Mark.